All right, thank you. So I'm going to present some work today. Uh, the bulk of what I do is with uh, my co-author, Ziad Obermeyer, but I'll also present from some papers briefly with uh, other co-authors, including Jens Ludwig, who uh, was discussing yesterday, and Jan Spies, who I think is here. Uh, OK, so uh, what I just want to do very briefly is to just start by uh, spending a couple of minutes uh, trying to talk about uh, how we, as applied empiricists, can use machine learning. And that's going to be what the bulk of my talk is going to be about, is to work through one application of it. Uh, but to do that, I just want to mention uh, how I would put it in the econometric toolbox. And there's a, a lot of interesting papers on this. Hal has a great JEP paper that's worth reading. So I just want to give um, a brief overview of this. Um, the way I would kind of do this is a simple machine learning task is like this where we're able to do face detection. An algorithm is able to take a bunch of photos and detect the faces in it uh, automatically. And the way I think we can think about this is face detection is, after all, an empirical task. We have a bunch of data. Uh, an image is just a data. It's just a uh, pixelated, grayscale, or colored uh, image. And you're simply trying to answer the question, does this image have a face? No, that image has, uh, has a face. Yes, it's just a trained activity. Um, <clears throat> And when you see complex convolutional neural nets like this, those are nothing more than function classes in that, uh, in that simple uh, fit y using x type of framework. So when you think about this, uh, it's easy to end up with something like this. Oh, look, I know how to do econometrics. I fit y with x. I know how to do econometrics in machine learning. I fit y with x. does well out of sample. But there's a big difference between these activities. The big difference is in machine learning, we tend to use a very high dimensional type of input. So if you do a back of the envelope calculation, any image has a set of x's, which is in, insanely bigger than any sample size you could hope to get of images. So it's natural to look at this and walk away from the machine learning literature by saying, oh, well, this is just better, as if there's no trade off, as if algorithms can give us y with x with high dimension, and what we've been doing traditionally is just worse. It just can't handle high dimensionality. So before I go to what I, the bulk of what I want to do is I just want to resolve this tension. And the way I'm going to resolve this tension is, let me skip this in the interest of time, is to just walk you through a very intuitive and simple example. And that example is the following. Suppose the true model is either y equals ax plus e or y equals bw plus e. So we've got two variables, x and w. And you know one of those variables matters. Suppose x uh, and w co-vary very strongly. This, <clears throat> and you're supposed to estimate the problem of ax plus bw. You can already see the covariance of x and w poses a fundamental problem for you in attributing whether the variation that's explained in y is coming from x or coming from w. In some sense, this is the heart of all of our concerns about estimation, is this is why your standard errors on any one x or w can be very large. But picture the geometry of the standard errors. Even if the projection of the ellipse of the standard error is very large in any one dimension, the joint test on whether x and w, one of them matters, is quite significant. And this happens a lot. A lot of estimation is the, attrib the attribution of the covariance. So why am I telling you this? Well, this is underlying a lot of what we do. But at the end of the day, you notice if I only cared about predicting the value of y, I don't care about this problem. And that is related to the difference between high dimensional and low dimensional. When we have high dimensional, we have lots of right-hand side variables. And if I cared about just predicting, I don't need to address this problem of attributing covariance to either any of the individual elements. So the prediction problem is significantly simpler in this sense. And at the end of the day, I think that's one of the big differences between the way we can effectively use high dimensional <laughs> estimators and low dimensional estimators. Low dimensional estimators are very well built to back out individual parameters of our estimates. High dimensional estimators are built to get out the y hats out of them. So in many ways, in my sort of caricatured way, I'd kind of call these beta hats, which is what we've been working on, and these as y hats. And I just want to set the stage for that, because I think one of the most effective ways that we'll have for using machine learning as applied econometricians is to kind of look up y hat, kind of look for econometric and applied empirical questions that have a y hat component. Uh, that, that's not, I'm trying, trying to elevate y hat work. It's, um, that's, that's merely the transpositional error of the activity. OK, so let me go through one application in detail. I hope that 
you find the application of interest, it's in health economics, but I also hope you can immediately start to see it has a little bit of a metaphor for a whole category of other applications that will have that flavor. So <clears throat> as many of you know, we're moving from jobs now to health. So the other important fact about health is that in the United States, a lot of healthcare spending is wasted. And that's probably the biggest thing that health economists kind of spend their days about. And in particular, a relevant fact for today is that we know lots of tests are just low, low value. And the way we know that is the average yield rates are really low. And we look at that and say the cost benefit of doing this test just doesn't make sense. And that, whether that is what I'm going to talk about today, stress tests or certain types of cancer tests or most screening things, we kind of go through and do a calculation. So what I want to think about is take a concrete example. Suppose you have a patient, they come into the hospital and they're complaining of one of these symptoms. Say they're saying, oh, you know, I've got chest pain. Um, I'm feeling a little bit of pain in the neck. That patient, these are the symptoms of heart attack. That's a patient whom you have to decide, did they just have a heart attack or are they having a heart attack right now? The reason you have to decide that is based on that decision, you want to test for a heart attack. And the reason you want to test for a heart attack is that if we know a person is just having or had a heart attack, there's extremely effective treatments that can deal with the scar tissue that formed in the process of a heart attack to then prevent a bunch of remarkable complications uh, that would follow if we just left the scar tissue there. There's sort of 50% reductions in mortality from the treatment. The treatment is very effective. The problem is the testing is very hard. Who is it that we ought to decide, who is it that we should test, kind of invasive, kind of expensive, so that we see if there's a heart attack and then we can implement treatment. This is canonical of a lot of applications in medicine is even when we've got efficacious treatment, we need to screen. Now why am I doing this, uh, bringing up this problem? Who to test is a Y hat problem. To see that, it's, first of all, let's observe that the return to testing is purely monotonic in yield. In fact, I'm just going to assume that, but we can put some formulas here that you know, we can decompose the return to testing as a function of the yield rate given your observables times the treatment efficacy. I'm going to make a covariance assumption, which we can talk about if you'd like in the discussion. So really, the question of who to test is the question of, given everything I observe, let's predict the yield, whether the test will find something. I'm sort of complicating things, but what I'm really saying is if you do a test and you don't find anything, that's a waste. If you do a test and you find something, given that's the only information you have, then you should apply treatment and you get the benefits of the treatment. Okay, so the basic health economics question, wow, we over-test, we have very low yields, actually has an interesting prediction component in it, which is given everything we observe, what is the expected yield? After all, this is the thing that the doctor is implicitly predicting in deciding whom to test. So I'm going to form a predictor. I won't get into the details of it. Basically, we take uh, Medicare claims. We've also done this with uh, more detailed data from a, a big hospital in Boston. Um, uh, and I, I won't get into the details. The point is, we take everything we knew prior to the, the, the visit and predict, will the test find anything? Also, we won't get into the question, an interesting question, which is, wow, I could have just done this prediction using a simple logit. What do I gain in doing sort of what we end up doing, which is sort of an ensemble model with gradient-boosted trees and OLS? There is quite a bit of gain, and we can talk about that if you'd like in the discussion. So let's start with the fact that if I look at the average yield rate, this is not a very efficacious test. It's about $120,000 per life year is the cost of this test. It's okay. It's on the not great. But now if I take in a holdout set and I predict risk um, using my predictor in this holdout set and I rank patients according to their expected yield, you'll see there's quite a bit of variation. So the average test not being cost effective hides the fact that the marginal test is ridiculously not cost effective. In a way, we've been understating the benefits, uh, the sort of the problems of overtesting. And you can see that in that down here, we're down to about 7.5% yield, which is m less than half of the 19.1% average yield. Of course, the flip side of that is we have a lot of very efficacious tests at the right-hand side. So thinking of these average tests as um, this is like smoking, uh, screening smokers for lung cancer, the bottom 30% is like cancer immunotherapy in terms of efficacy. So within this one testing problem, we have a lot of predictable heterogeneity that will allow us to see that there are some really uh, low-value tests and some high-value tests. So as a result, one fairly small but I think useful point is to say, 
typically in this literature, we argue that there is low-value care by using averages to look at testing and sometimes by looking at, oh, what happens when, you know, across hospitals. But ultimately, here we have sort of a, a generative tool, which is a prediction tool, that allows us to look at a more relevant object than the average. It allows us to look at the margin. It allows us to look at the dispersion of tests and say, if I look at the bottom 5%, bottom 10%. To me, that's kind of a, a useful win. But I think there's another, when you start approaching it this way, there's another thing that happens which is kind of uh, interesting, which is if I go back and I said, oh, these were very low value care, and this was very high value here, it is, in fact, very high value. There's about a 42% discovery yield rate there, and at 42%, you really should be testing these people. But 88% but of them go untested. Of course, I only have the test results for the tested, but I have the testing rates. So while we've been looking at over-testing because we've been looking at the tested population, we also ought to look at the test rate decision. And when you look at the right-hand side of the distribution, there's at least a puzzle to be thought through what is going on. Of course, partly what's going on, and I think this is another lesson that I've taken away, is there's a problem which is largely overlooked in the machine learning literature because it doesn't really come up with some of the automation tasks that people worry about, which is obvious to everybody in this room, which is what am I doing? I'm finding a patient, they come in, and I say, wow, they look like high risk, and the doctor fails to test them. But that's like, there's a selection problem here. Am I really going to believe the algorithm? How would I know? After all, we don't have the labels or the test results on the untested. We have no idea what happened to them. It's pure speculation. Of course, a little, you could start to go and try to impute the labels based on Xs, but I think that would be a huge mistake because as much of data as you might have in the claims data, there's actually quite a bit of private information the physician has access to. And we talk a little bit about in the paper about how to do that. I think this problem is generic and important. It appears a lot, and as I say, it's largely ignored. Okay. So I'm going to talk about two procedures for dealing with the selective labels problem fairly uh, briefly. Let me just check this time right here. Um, oh, I have plenty of time. The first procedure I want to deal with is the fact that we don't know what the test would have produced had the person been tested. But given that you've got this sort of panel data that you're able to follow them over time, we are able to observe what are the other things that happened to this person when they were sent home untested. So I'm going to look at that. The second thing that I'm going to use, uh, and I'll sort of sketch this because I don't have time to go into it, is selective labels is the kind of problem that when you just sort of throw a machine learning algorithm at it, uh, you, can, you, know, you, don't, you can kind of ignore. But it's the kind of problem that as economists we spent a long time worried about. So it's no, it's no surprise that a lot of the tricks that we have for causal inference also port to this literature. So if you think about it, the second thing we can do is we can say, oh, well, actually, here are the 12% or th that are tested and 88% that are untested. There's actually a lot of physician variation or random assignment type procedures that's going to give me labels into that 88%. Let me see what that population looks like. So my two strategies are going to be to find otherwise and to use Something that's a hybrid of causal inference strategies, which is find exogenous variation, but to use it here not to find a treatment effect, but instead to uncover more labels. Okay. So let's start with the first one. Here what we've done is we've looked over the next 180 days at the people who are sent home who are of high risk, who are untested. And here I'm going to look at uh, a positive troponin value. What this means is uh, I'm looking at the percentage of people who come back in the next 180 days, and they come back and are then tested with a blood test for troponin and are found to have a positive troponin value, which means that you recently just had a heart attack. And in fact, you find that the highest decile has about a 22% troponin uh, rate, uh, positive troponin rate. That's probably an understatement because some people may not have had this adverse event and come back. Uh, these are really high troponin rates, which I can just calibrate for you. This is a massive, massive, massive heart attack, which uh, if you're having at a 2% rate, it's just uh, very high. Here are other observable things. Um, this is the probability that they had some adverse event, heart attack, cardiac arrest, urgent procedures, death, uh, which is a, a pretty adverse event. Um, and you can see in the untested, this has a pretty high yield. Again, it, for me, these things are a little bit of a surprise because you should keep in mind, we've been trying to get a predicted risk for testing, but in fact, they're finding the effects and the consequences for the wise, for the untested. Um, of course, this by itself is not, uh, is, 
uh, well, I'll, go, I'll give you two more numbers and then I'll move on. So here you see the mortality rate, 16% uh, at the top. Here you see the cardiac arrest rate. Okay, so that's that category. I think that that way of approaching it is useful, but I think ultimately it's got a, a, a low ceiling. And the, and the low ceiling is that all we can do is make an indirect inference that, wow, these people were pretty bad off. We have no idea whether an actual test would have produced anything in this population. That is, it's, not impl it's not implausible, nor is it particularly evidentiary. So the second approach is to take advantage of arbitrary seeming variation. And um, there are two sources of variation. I'll sketch one in the interest of time, and then I'll just mention the other one. Um, and <clears throat> oh, this is. Sorry, let me go back. So the first one is the recognition of a classic sort of economics of incentives type situation. When you show up at the hospital, if you show up Monday through Thursday, um, I would admit you overnight, and then uh, you would be tested the next, the next day. Okay. If you show up Friday, Saturday, and there's no uh, catheterization uh, capacity in the hospital, and we're looking at the subset that don't have it, the problem is I would have to admit you overnight and then keep you until the, the following Monday. So it's like a lot, of, it's a lot of effort. So in fact, what you find, I'm um, sorry, you can't see this. You find significantly lower testing rates for the people uh, who show up on Friday, Saturday versus the other days. And so that's like a, you find this sort of variation across that spectrum. And um, one thing that's interesting about that is uh, that seems to be fairly balanced on observables, and we can talk about whether this is a reasonable identification strategy. But you'll notice there is this population that's getting tested here, then there's this population that's being tested at a higher rate. One way to understand the role of unobservables is to understand what is the difference in yields for people here versus people here, conditional on their x's. So if you believe there's a lot of z's, a lot of unobservables, then what you'd expect is that these marginal tests have very different yields than you expected. So in fact, you could take the average yields and actually calculate the marginal yield and work out the, mar the, 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 the yield of the marginal patients, okay? So once you know the testing rate. And in fact, what you find is actually pretty good evidence. I've graphed here the, the zeros, the ones, you know, in the weekend, weekdays, but also the margins. And you can see the, the predictor is quite aligned all across these cases. Now, one thing you find is, on the other hand, and this is something I want to mention at depth and then finish on, while the predictor is marginally aligned, if you had an algorithm decide if we're going to go from a high testing regime to a lower testing regime, from a weekday to a weekend, who should I test less of? Well, the doctor is actually testing less of everybody across the predicted risk decile, and we know the yield is calibrated there. The algorithm would say, why are those the marginal patients? These should be the marginal patients. And so you can see off the bat a huge change in efficiency by simply cutting these patients instead of cutting these patients. And that's a sense in which you already see a great deal of under-testing on the weekends. These patients are the under-tested weekend patients. They're high risk, but because it's a weekend, we fail to test them. If we wanted to achieve that test rate, we could just have failed to test these patients. And we know their, their lab values. Okay. So the bottom line is there are many untested high yield patients. We're not just over testing, we're also under testing. And this is a first order effect at the same level as over testing was. So this what makes me revisit our economic model underlying this view. So a common view is that we test over a threshold. This is sort of the moral, the, the moral hazard model is that the threshold for testing is too low. Okay, so this is the benefit of testing. We simply move the threshold to the left. But we often gloss over an important part of this model, which is that we're also assuming that the risk prediction, the sorting across these units is very good. If doctors fail to rank very effectively, then in fact, misprediction says that when we move over here, sure, we've set the threshold too low, but there are first order problems in simply missorting. For example, there's a bunch of patients here that are below the threshold. It's just, they're not ranked correctly. And <clears throat> As a result, I think this is relatively important because the levers we use depend on the models we have, and the moral hazard view, we'd simply disincentivize testing. I'll just show how stark this is and then stop. So a very common view is, yeah, you know who has it together? 
these low testing, low utilization hospitals are very efficient. Why can't we make the high testing hospitals more like these low testing ones? So here what we have is the high testing hospitals, the low testing hospitals. And in fact, the low testing hospitals test less. But you know what's absurd? They test less of everybody. Yes, they test less down here. Great, we've reduced underuse. But they're testing much less down here as well. And if you calibrate the loss and yield here, these are a lot of very high return tests that you're throwing away. Looking at the average yield tells you nothing as to how much of this problem is going on, how much of this problem are you getting rid of. It's just a very crude measure. And in fact, it raises the question when we incentivize uh, places to be like Utah, are we actually, yes, we're reducing costs, but are we leaving a lot of money on the table? So let me, um, let me skip this part and end on this. I think that there's some general lessons from this exercise, which I hope you see apply to other things. I think prediction was central to this activity. I think without being able to form a meaningful why hat, I never really could have gotten off the bat. Was machine learning central? I'd say yes and no. It is definitely true that the machine learning predictor does, in a statistical sense, much better. The tails it finds are much better. Could I have done something similar with just OLS? I think so. The results wouldn't have been as stark, whatever. I think for me, half the gain is from using machine learning. Half the gain for me is starting to think more about prediction itself as an activity. Uh, micro prediction. Obviously, macro people have spent a long time thinking about it. Second, I just want to point out that it is very important to not think of this activity as a mechanical application of machine learning. There is a lot of machine learning work that is starting to work with social science data sets. I think we have a lot to give to that area. I think the selective labels problem is a very important example of this. I think because we're used to working with these data and we're used to decisions and counterfactuals, we start thinking about these things. Finally, I just want to end on this, which is it's easy to think the goal of these exercises is to build decision aids. Oh, we want to help doctors test better. But I actually think that these tools can help us sort of promote theorizing and hypothesizing in new ways and actually build, uh, change how we understand a significant economic area. All right, thank you. All right, uh, this is a great paper. If you judge the quality of like a tweet by how much it's retweeted or the quality of a Facebook post by how much it's liked, you'd probably judge how much I like a paper by how much I forwarded it to people. And I don't think I've forwarded a paper um, quite as much as this paper. I forwarded it to many, many different people. Um, overview of the paper, common view is that medical practice involves a large amount of wasteful spending. Um, it's been estimated um, third, of medical, um, third of medical care spending is unnecessary. And there's also a common view that the overspending results largely from overprovision. Um, which results from misaligned incentives like um, um, pay, pay per, um, for service um, compensation schemes. Um, but it, um, this paper raises the question, is the problem over provision or is it inefficient provision? Prior research um, employing regression techniques by Abeluk et al. Um, points to the latter, that inefficient provision. They use just standard regression techniques is more of a problem than over-provision. And um, O&M make the same point using state-of-the-art um, machine learning methods. Um, they focus on one medical decision, testing for heart attacks in the ER department. They compare actual testing decisions to counterfactual decisions made using a machine learning technique. They find that the provision of tests could be dramatically improved based on information that's available at the time of the decision. You could cut, aggregate, aggregate testing to the rate of low testing doctors, but find 55% 55 more, uh, 55 more patients with heart attacks. Or you could raise aggregate testing levels um, to the level of high testing doctors and cut by 61% the number of untested patients who go on to experience adverse events. So um, when I read this, I kind of had the same feeling that I sometimes have um, when I see a TED talk. and. Um, it seems like, oh, if we only do this, we can change the world. Um, but I think, um, and the, the paper gives the impression that there are myriad similar opportunities in medicine. And I wonder to what degree this is the case. Testing is a big t ticket item, but there's a, lot, uh, there's a whole lot of testing like PSA tests that probably wouldn't benefit from methods of this type. And a whole lot of the high spending in medical care isn't about, isn't about testing. It's about things like, um, 
dealing with um, cancer using very high-tech methods like proton knife and stuff like that. Um, one of the strongest predictors of excess testing was that the patient was brought, this is from the paper, the patient was brought in or referred in by another provider. And these might be um, difficult situations in which to avoid testing. If, someone, if a patient is brought in and referred to, it would be very difficult to say, sorry, I'm not going to test them. And this kind of raises the question of whether there are institutional constraints on using these types of methods. And also there's evidence that um, prices and not utilization seem to be the biggest drivers of recent increases in costs. This is from the Healthcare Costs Institute. Um, and these are changes in utilization and these are changes in costs. And they find that almost all of the increases in medical expenses are due to the price side not to the utiliza utilization side, which is what this paper focuses on. Um, continuing on the same point, um, I'm not aware of any example of these methods um, either being used to determine testing. And I wonder, is this because the methods didn't exist until now, or because physicians, possibly abetted by patients, would be loath to give up their prerogative to make testing decisions? This is another institutional constraint. Physicians don't want, necessarily want to turn over their decision-making capacity to, um, to algorithms. And there's some research on this. Why do patients derogate physicians who use a computer-based diagnostic support system? Algorithm, there's a term that's um, come into common use, algorithm aversion. People erroneously avoid algorithms after seeing them err. Um, however, there's also um, some more promising research showing that if you kind of combine algorithms with people, um, it both makes the people more, it, use the, it makes the algorithm more acceptable to people if human judgment is combined with the algorithm. And also you can actually get better judgments by, in some cases by combining the two. Another um, issue, another kind of fact, kind of raising questions about the larger potential is the fact that the European countries provide comparable and much more equitable medical, medical care at a fraction of the cost that we do. And they're probably no more advanced when it comes to these kinds of methods. Um, they're much more advanced, actually, when it comes to kind of crude blanket prohibitions on things. Like um, we have NICE in Britain, which just says um, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't use these procedures for these types of patients. And it does a pretty good job of limiting costs without um, kind of tailoring in the way that this paper suggests we should be doing. Um, there's a few sampling issues. There's a long list of exclusions in the paper, including potentially people responsible for a large fraction of costs in the U.S. health system. Um, that would include patients who, um, whose general poor health might mandate a different approach to testing since they might not be healthy enough to undergo or want treatments resulting from testing. I totally understand why you did it from a methodological perspective, but a lot of um, the most high cost people are not included in the sample. Um, Medicare claims data excludes, um, the, the data used in the paper excludes non-fee-for-service um, patients since their claim history is not observed. There's no description uh, of the reimbursement characteristics of the large urban hospital. That's the other major sample in the paper, but I assume it's also fee-for-service, right? Yeah. Um, and these fee-for-service arrangements may be especially prone to inefficiency. Um, I didn't find the comparison to other types of um, hospitals very uh, persuasive. So the paper compares private and not-for-profit hospitals. But um, I have two, um, in Pittsburgh, there's two not-for-profit hospitals. And I can say that, I can tell you they are absolutely cutthroat in their methods. And they claim not to make a profit. But UPMC made a, almost a billion dollar profit um, one year. They just didn't call it a profit. Um, yeah, I think it would be really interesting to do a similar analysis on, man uh, on a managed or integrated care system like a Kaiser Permanente or a salaried system like a Mayo Clinic. It would be really interesting to do the same analysis with one of these. Um, are misaligned, so the paper um, says that misallocation is uh, kind of makes the point that mis misallocation is a um, much bigger problem than overprovision, um, the kind of overprovision you expect to emerge from misaligned incentives. 
are, um, is that real, are misaligned incentives not really that important? There is a lot of evidence, including some of my own research, that misaligned incentives are a huge source of problems in the US health care system. I recently published a paper showing that when, you, when the academic medical centers um, limited the de drug detailing, it pretty radically changed the prescribing pra practices of the physicians. But that's just one of many, many different studies making that point. Testing for heart attacks in the ED is not one of the classic examples of fee-for-service leading to over-provision because the ED physicians um, don't make more money if they provide these tests. Um, the paper does reveal evidence of massive over-testing. Um, there is a lot of over-testing. Um, and to, in my mind, a major way that better guidance systems could improve health care um, is by forcing conflicted physicians' hands. So physicians now have a big incentive to over-provide health care. And I think one of the great benefits of a method like this would be it could, um, it could um, force their hands. Um, finally, um, on, the, on the issue of incentives, I think for algorithmic testing to be widely adopted, and I think this paper does provide really strong evidence that it should be, um, it needs to be incorporated into the payment structure of physicians. Um, because that's how the, our health system operates. Um, interactions between institutions and methods. The medical system in the US is broken. Um, there are inequalities, administrative costs, et cetera, dramatic over-provision of many tests and procedures. The Byzantine character of the US system has implications for incentives preve for preventive care because patients come in and out of the system. The, um, um, there's no interest in following up. There's very little interest in prevention. And it also has, the ability, um, has in implications for the ability to make use of the types of methods such as those um, that Sendel um, and Obermeyer um, talk about. Um, a straight, um, that what, what they show is it's, it's incredibly, incredibly difficult for them to do the tests that they do because different health systems use different codes for d um, different procedures and outcomes. And so the very Byzantine nature of the health system makes it really difficult um, to implement these methods. Um, all right, um, I'll skip over that and end on a positive note. Um, particularly interesting finding, um, all this suggests that when presented with a complex patient who might have more than one problem, for example, COPD and heart disease, physicians often focus on either one or the other. So patients who have multiple conditions are likely to be under-tested. Um, I think that's a really interesting finding, and it helps to show the potential for these methods. And finally, a point we can all agree on. Machine learning, this is from the paper, and I totally agree with it. Machine learning has an interesting role to play, both in applied decision-making and in testing theories in social science. Comparing idealized predictions to the actions of individual actors is a fascinating um, new lens through which to view human behavior in complex environments. In particular, it can expose bias, biases and reveal errors that were previously unsuspected. I totally agree with the punchline of the paper. Okay.